Next up in our discussion of coastal siliciclastic environments is the delta environment. So deltas are the interface between river and coastal settings, and they're characterized by a mixture of fluvial or river, wave, and tidal processes. Deltas are protuberances or bulges in the shoreline built where a river enters into a larger water body. So this can be into the ocean, which is most often the case, but also into a lake. And the delta setting includes parts that are subaerial or above water, called the delta plane, and parts that are submarine or below water, including the delta front and the prodelta. Fluvial processes are obviously important in deltas, since the delta is where the river empties into the ocean, but the shallow parts of a delta can also be heavily reworked by wave energy or tidal energy. So the primary way to identify delta deposits is to look for that mixture of fluvial sedimentary indicators, such as ripples or dunes, along with wave or tidal sedimentary indicators, such as wave ripples, hummocky or swaley cross stratification, flazer bedding, inclined heterothic, etc. But what else could we use to tell that we might be looking at a delta? Well, in a delta, the river typically branches into multiple channels called distributary channels and sand is deposited as a bar at the mouth of each of those called a distributary mouth bar. There's a lot of complexity in these bars from the density contrast of the water, the frictional interaction, and the fluvial discharge, but the key feature of distributary mouth bars is the rapid deposition of large amounts of sediment because the river water rapidly slows down when it hits the standing ocean or lake water. So the rapid deceleration of that river water and the resulting energy loss both lead to rapid sedimentation. This is similar to what you learned about with flow stripping in submarine fans. So mouth bars form primarily from unidirectional flow, so they can contain dunes and ripples, but the rapid deposition also means you might see climbing ripples in the mouth bar. The bar may also contain erosional surfaces called reactivation surfaces within it because it forms during occasional high energy flood events. But this is sort of key feature one, if you see climbing ripples that could point towards a delta environment as opposed to a regular fluvial or some other kind of shallow environment. Another important difference is that deltas tend to have steeper slopes than a normal shallow marine environment does. Although the diagram at the top here is really exaggerated, deltas have this large scale bed geometry called a clinoform, a sigmoidal or S-shaped shape with a flatter top set beds at the top a steeper foreset, shallowing out toe sets, and a fairly flat bottom set that merges with the underlying layers. In reality, these clinoforms dip at just a couple degrees, as shown in the photo, where the yellow lines trace horizontal beds at the base and the top, and between that you can see these very gently dipping foresets in the delta front. So because of the potentially steeper slopes, you can potentially find convolute bedding or even larger slumps in the deeper parts of deltas such as the delta front or the pro delta. High sedimentation rates near the river mouth also promote slope instability because the rapidly accumulating sediment doesn't have time to compact and it's really water rich. This kind of soft sediment deformation really doesn't occur often in other coastal environments. So if, that, if it's present, that should be another good marker that you might be in a delta situation. Another key aspect of deltas is that the river water can push offshore especially during floods, causing unidirectional flow in the marine delta front environment. These plumes of water are categorized by their density with the hypopycnal plumes having a density less than seawater and the hyperpycnal plumes having a density greater than seawater. Because seawater is salty and river water is fresh, normal river flow, if it contains not a lot of sediment, is hypopycnal and it spreads out along the water surface. As it spreads, there's friction with the ocean water, so it loses energy and gradually deposits sediment from suspension, leading to a fairly continuous rain of hemipelagic sediment. But when the river floods, in contrast, it's, it can be carrying a huge sediment load, so in fact can be denser than seawater, or hyperpycnal. When that's the case, this plume of water and sediment can flow as a turbulent sediment gravity flow, basically a turbidity current, down the slope. And as these flows lose energy, they deposit their sediment from suspension, perhaps with some modification by traction. So these hyperpycnal flows deposit thin, normally graded beds, just like a turbidite, because they are turbulent flows depositing suspended sediment by unhindered settling, 
and it can be interbedded with the hemipelagic deposits from the hypopycnal plumes. Well, because there's unidirectional flow, these delta front environments, which might have these, these hyperpycnal deposits, can also have current ripples in them, which again, otherwise don't really occur in shallow marine settings. So current ripples in otherwise a marine environment could also be a good indicator that you're in a setting influenced by a delta. So the clues for a broader delta type setting include unidirectional ripples in a marine environment, possibly including climbing ripples closer to the mouth bar and the potential for soft sediment deformation. But let's dig into more specific delta subenvironments, the deep submarine pro-delta, the shallower submarine delta front, and the largely above water delta plane. The pro-delta is the deepest part of the delta, below the influence of waves or tides. And because it's far from the sediment and the energy source, it's characterized by very fine-grained facies. In fact, the pro-delta will often resemble regular offshore facies and might be very difficult to tell apart. But again, you might have graded deposits from hyperpycnal plumes and also the potential for soft sediment deformation. Those might be your only clues that it's a delta. And if you don't see those, it can be very hard without seeing the overlying sediments to identify that you're in a pro-delta and not a regular offshore environment. Delta facies always prograde, or to say another way, the shoreline shift in deltas is always regressive. So the pro-delta will be overlain by delta front sediments. The delta front is a more proximal environment, so it's coarser grained than the pro-delta is. As a result, delta successions are pretty much always coarsening upwards. Because the delta front is above wave base, there might also be some signals of wave or tidal influence. So you might see sedimentary structures like wave ripples or hummocky cross edification or bidirectional cross beds in a, in a tidal setting, um, in addition to the possibility of current ripples or even climbing ripples in the shallower part hyperpycnal plume deposits, and potentially soft sediment deformation in some deltas. Finally, the mostly subaerial part of the delta is called the delta plain. In a river-dominated delta, it includes the river distributary channels and the shallow bays between those channels called interdistributary bays. The distributary channel deposits themselves should be coarse-grained. They'll often look a lot like regular fluvial deposits and, and may be difficult to distinguish. Uh, unless you see some kind of marine influence from, from waves or, or tides. And the interdistributary bays between the channels are often have quite variable sediments and may even be cyclical as they fill with sediment and then become abandoned and subside. So an interdistributary bay might begin, for example, where the red arrow is shown in the figure there, um, with marine mudstones, perhaps with a lot of terrestrial organic material from, from plants and, and swampy material, um, and might end up as they fill up in the yellow arrow as terrestrial, almost terrestrial swamps that form potentially coal deposits or, or have a lot of organic material. Um, there also are likely to be things that look a lot like crevasse blade deposits within this environment from uh, when the river floods. Uh, this is similar to what you might expect in a meandering fluvial uh, overbank environment. So I, I said before that deltas are typically coarsening upward successions, but here's one point of caution. The delta plain might actually be significantly finer grained than the delta front in these interdistributary bay environments, even though the delta plain is a shallower or more proximal setting. Although rivers are the things that supply the sediment to the deltas, the energy can come from fluvial, wave, or tidal processes, or a combination of those. In a very wave-influenced delta, the distributary mouth bars that form from the river are heavily reworked by the waves into shore parallel linear sand ridges that look a lot like beach deposits or shore face deposits. Right, so in this type of delta, the delta plain may be very difficult to tell apart from a beach or a shore face. Maybe there will be some fluvial influence. Perhaps you will see some current ripple, uh, some unidirectional current ripples, um, but you might need to consider the context provided by the facie succession, especially what is underneath the delta the delta plane, uh, if you can recognize underlying pro-delta and delta front sediments that coarsen up, 
this really wave influenced um, deposit at the top, you might be able to recognize it as a delta deposit. And similarly, in tide dominated deltas, the mouth bars can be reworked into these more shore perpendicular elongated sand bodies. In this situation, the delta plane may look similar to tidal flats or tidal estuary facies with bidirectional cross beds or flazer bedding, inclined heterolithic stratification in, in, the, in the distributary channels, and things like that. So again, the context provided by the overall facies succession, especially the underlying units, might be your best clue if it's a very strongly tidally influenced delta, um, delta plane environment. So one final note of caution as you consider the sequence stratigraphic context of deltas. Like meandering fluvial and submarine fan lobes, deltas, especially the delta plane part, can have strong inherent cyclicity, regardless of what base level is doing. So the active delta lobe will prograde outward and accumulate sediment, but eventually the river channel will switch location in a process called avulsion and that initial lobe becomes abandoned. The abandoned lobe no longer receives sediment, so it subsides, primarily due to the compaction of the original sediment, back into a marine environment. Um, and then the river will evolve again and the cycle can repeat. So be very cautious about interpreting cycles, especially in the delta plane. Um, it's probably best to interpret them as normal lobe switching unless you have specific evidence that these are allocyclic base level cycles, um, because deltas just have this inherent cyclicity um, that will create cyclical deposits regardless of what base level is doing.